Welcome to the Recurrent Neural Network course. I would like to start off by saying that this is an intermediate to advanced course and is not for all levels. Some knowledge in deep learning concepts is required in order to benefit from the topics that will be covered. The student must already be somewhat familiar with technologies such as Python, NumPy, TensorFlow, or Keras. The student must also be familiar with feedforward neural networks and the concept of backpropagation. If you are not familiar with any of these concepts, I highly advise you to take my self-driving car course, which will teach you all of these concepts in great detail, where by the end, you will have gathered enough knowledge to simulate your very own autonomous vehicle that drives on its own. I have left a coupon in the next lecture of this course. In a feedforward neural network, inputs are fed to the network and transformed into an output. In other words, the information travels from the input layer to the output layer. There are no feedback loops. The output of each layer does not interact with previous layers. Feedforward neural networks are very useful in pattern recognition where the number of inputs and outputs is fixed. Like in an image classification problem where an image of a dog with a fixed number of pixels is fed into a neural network to produce the label dog from a fixed number of classes. As stated previously, these types of networks are great in identifying patterns where the input is a fixed size vector. However, they tend to perform very poorly when the input data is a sequence. Now what exactly is a sequence? A sequence is a stream of ordered data where each data point is dependent on the other. Imagine if the dog we have in front of us started walking. The following animation you are seeing is a stream of images that are ordered one after the other, hence forming a sequence. The neural network in front of us would have a really hard time determining what action the dog is taking since it has no way of referring back to previous inputs. Now another good example of a sequence is a sentence. As you can see, the sentence is a sequence of words where each word in the sentence depends on the other, which gives meaning to the sentence. Notice how order matters. If you decide to move the words around, the sequence is broken, and the meaning of the sentence is lost. Sequences are also very important to make predictions. To put it simply, imagine you have a ball, and you are asked to predict the trajectory of the ball. Now any prediction you are to make would be considered a guess. However, if we were to actually show the previous sequence of locations of the ball, you will quickly realize that it's much easier to make a useful prediction. Sequential data is all around us. The stock market graph is a sequence of pips, and you can use the history of this data to determine if the market will perform positively or negatively in the future. Or the predictive text in your phones that looks at your sentence or a sequence of words and tries to determine what the next word is. Now that you have an idea what sequential data is, you will quickly realize that sequential data doesn't have a fixed number of inputs. For example, in the case of the sentence, it can have a various number of words. You will also realize that order is extremely important. In a traditional feedforward neural network, when training a classifier for cats and dogs, the order at which you input images of cats and dogs doesn't really matter that much, which isn't the case for recurrent neural networks. And finally, in order to make predictions using sequential data, the neural network should be able to remember the history of inputs. As in the case that you are trying to predict the last word in a sentence, it's important for you to know the words that came before it. Now these problems presented are less feasible for traditional neural networks, but are more applicable in recurrent neural networks. Now what exactly are RNNs? RNNs are a type of neural networks that are designed to make predictions with data that come in the form of a sequence. They do this with the use of a concept called sequential memory. A traditional neural network looks something like this. It's got an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. Now in order for our model to make predictions using a sequence of inputs, it must be able to hold some of these inputs in memory. 
which is why we add a loop to the network that can pass outputs internally from the current step of the network onto the next step. Now to make this diagram even more useful, you can unfold it. In the case you had a sentence with four words, the network would look something like this, where each input is a word, the input is injected in what we call the state, or in other words, the memory of the network. Now you'll also notice that the state of the network holds in memory information about every previous input that was introduced into the network. And in the case of this network, every state produces an output based on some internal calculations that happen within which we will cover in great detail later on. Now this network produces an output at every step, but this isn't the case for all the networks. For example, the following recurrent neural network is known as a one-to-many network, which means that it takes an input at the first step and releases an output at all the steps. This network is very popular in solving image captioning problems where the network takes one image as an input and spits out a sentence of words. A second useful recurrent neural network is the many-to-one network. This network takes in many inputs at different steps of the network and produces an output at the final step. This type of network is commonly used in sentiment analysis where the words in a sentence are inputted in order at every step of the network and sentiment is produced as an output to describe if the sentence is positive or negative, for example. A third network includes the many-to-many -many network. This network takes many inputs at the beginning of the network and produces many outputs. This type of network is mostly useful when translating text from one language to the other, where the many inputs are the texts in the first language and the output produced would be the text in the other language. There are many other types of networks with many different applications, which makes these sequential networks much more powerful than our traditional neural networks. As you might expect, sequential networks are much more powerful compared to fixed networks since they are not restricted to a fixed number of computational steps, allowing us to create much more intelligent applications. RNNs attempt to capture information from previous inputs by maintaining internal memory elements. Let's explore the network again. We have our input, our output, and in our hidden layer we have our state, which is another term for internal memory. Now each of these connections has a weight. WI represents the weight matrix connecting the inputs to the state. WO represents the weight matrix between the state and the output and WS corresponds to the weight matrix connecting the state of the previous time step to the state of the next time step. Let's unfold the model so it makes more sense. This model has three time steps, where the first step is at t minus 2, and the final step is at t. Now in order to obtain the state at step 3, we use an activation function. This could be sigmoid, tanh, relu, or many others. We then multiply the input it with its corresponding weight wi, and we add it to the product of the previous state multiplied by the corresponding weight ws. Now the output vector is calculated by obtaining the linear combination of the states with their corresponding weight matrices wo. Now depending on the application, the output could also be computed in a softmax function. And finally, it's important for us to determine how accurate our output is. And we do this by calculating the error. Now there are many types of error functions like mean squared error and cross entropy. We'll just focus on mean squared error for now. Now the mean squared error for a selected step is error at t equal to desired output minus current step output squared. Now that we know how to calculate the state, the output, and the error, we have to figure out how to train such networks. First of all, notice how RNNs share the same parameter weights between each time step. At every time step, the input weight is the same, the state weight is the same, and the output weight is the same. So the training and updating of each weight won't be as computationally intensive as you might think. Now how can we find a good set of weights to minimize the error? You will realize that training such neural networks is very similar to the ones in feedforward neural networks, but with a slight change. Now in order to train recurrent neural networks, we use what is called backpropagation through time. 
When training a neural network, what we do is we train a network at a specific time, taking into account all that has happened before. Let's bring back our recurrent neural network. As mentioned previously, it's got an input, a state, and an output. And using the produced output, we can compare it to the desired output and compute the error. Now in order to update each weight matrix, we need to subtract the partial derivative of each weight with respect to their errors. In other words, we will use gradient descent to update the weights. Let's unfold the network again and go into the math with more detail. Now our goal is to calculate the updated weights WI, WO, and WS. We're going to start with WO, the weight value between our state and our output. As stated previously, the change required to update the value is the partial derivative or gradient descent of the output weight with respect to the error at step t. Now to compute that derivative, we use the chain rule. Now we need to ask ourselves, how do we get from the error at step t to the weight at wo? We need to work backwards. The error et is dependent on the output. So we find the derivative of et with respect to the output. And the output OT is dependent on the weight of the output. So we find the derivative of the output OT with respect to the weight of the output. Let's also refer back to our equations to make sense of it some more. Our goal was to go from the error ET to our weight WO. Now to put it simply, the common variable between the two equations is the output OT. So we can apply the chain rule by applying the derivative of ET with respect to OT, and then multiply it by the derivative of OT with respect to WO. This is a very simplistic explanation of how we get to the following equation. If you're not sure what's going on, I would highly recommend you brush up on partial derivatives in the chain rule. Now moving on, we're going to determine the gradient descent of the state weight. We need to figure out how to get from the error E to the state weight WS. And just like before, we start with the derivative of ET with respect to the output, followed by the derivative of OT with respect to ST, and followed by the derivative of ST with respect to WS. Now we don't just stop here. We have to go back and do it all again for the previous steps. This is where the name backpropagation through time comes from. Now to do this, we're going to go right back to the air. We're going to add the derivative of ET with respect to the output, multiplied by the derivative of OT with respect to ST, followed by the derivative of ST with respect to ST minus one, and finally we close it with the derivative of ST minus one over WS. And now we have to do it one last time for our final step. And it is the exact same process all the way until T minus two. This is essentially how you calculate the gradient descent for the weight of the state. And now we need to find the gradient descent of our weight input wi with respect to the error. And just like before, we're going to start at the error et with respect to the output, then down from the output with respect to the state, and then down to the state with respect to the weight of the input. And then we do it again for the previous step and the one before it. And in summary, this is the general way of updating our weights using the technique of backpropagation through time. In the next few videos, we're going to be taking a more practical approach by solving a recurrent neural network problem. The problem we're going to be solving is a time series problem. We're going to feed sequences from a noisy sine function into our RNN model, and from that we're going to recover the actual sine function. We're also only going to be feeding the first 1500 time steps for training, allowing the network to also perform a prediction for the last 500 time steps. There are four main steps to accomplishing such a task. First, we're going to create our data set by generating a noisy sign function. Then we're going to prepare our data set for training, followed by creating and training our model. And finally, we're going to plot our results for observation and make any necessary modifications. Now in order to begin writing functionality, we're going to make use of Google Collab as our working environment. Just write Google Collab in any search engine and click on the link. Now click on New Notebook.
Now the first step into creating our neural network model is to start by generating a data set. The data set we will be producing is a sine wave with a lot of noise. Let's start by importing some basic dependencies. We're going to import NumPy as NP, followed by matplotlib.pyplot as PLT, and run the cell. Now in the next cell, we're just going to set a random seed. We chose the number zero, but you can input any number you like. The point of setting a random seed is to make sure that any random value generated is reproducible. This is useful if you ever run into an error or a problem when you run your application, allowing your error or problem to be reproduced every time you rerun your program. Afterwards, we're going to initialize a variable t. We will set it to np.arrange with the first variable being 0 and the second one being 1500. Now all np.arrange does is it creates a range of values from one value to the other. In our case, from 0 to 1500. Let's print the variable to make sure it's working as intended. And as you can see, we have an array of integers from 0 to 1499. Let's proceed to actually create our independent variable x. We set x equal to the sine function from NumPy, setting the frequency to 0.02, .02, and then we multiply it by the array of dependent variables t from 0 to 1500. Let's proceed to plot the following function using the plot function from matplotlib. And you'll notice that it produces a perfect sine wave. Now we need to add some noise to our function, and we're going to do that by using the random.uniform function from NumPy. The random.uniform function generates an array of numbers, and in our case we chose 1500 numbers, that vary in range from negative 1 to 1. Adding that to our sine wave will provide us with enough noise to move forward. Let's run the cell again. And you can clearly see the noise being applied to our data. I'm going to actually copy and paste our function without noise right under and I'm going to change its name to x without noise and then I'm going to plot that. Now we have a visual representation of our data and what the sine wave should actually look like. Now that we have our data prepared, we're going to start off by importing the necessary dependencies to train our model. The first one will be the familiar sequential class. This is something that was covered extensively in the self-driving car course. But in summary, a sequential model is a linear stack of functional layers that constitute our network model. Now the layers we're going to be importing are the familiar dense layer and the simple RNN layer. We'll initialize the sequential model. Now the first layer of our sequential model will be the simple RNN layer, and we chose the tanh activation function for it. This should be familiar to you from the previous theory lectures where the simple RNN model uses the following state equation, and in this case the activation function was tanh. The parameter units corresponds to the number of state units for our recurrent neural network. We're going to just have it as one, but it can be increased to optimize your network depending on the problem. Afterwards, we were going to add our closing output layer using the dense class. And since we only have one output at the end of the sequence, we'll specify it as one. Afterwards, we're going to compile our model. We're going to be calculating our loss with the mean squared error, and the optimizer we chose was RMS prop, which uses adaptive learning rate methods to compute the gradient descent. It's a very good and fast optimizer. You could also try other ones such as the Atom optimizer as well. Our model is now ready for training and we're going to be using the fit function to do so. We input the training set as the first parameter with its corresponding label train y. We chose 200 epochs for training and a batch size of 16, but you can play around with those parameters to optimize your results. Let's run our cell 
and the training begins. We can see a lot of progress being made in the reduction of our loss. Now the training function returns a history of the performance of our model. We're going to plot it to get a visual representation of the training process. We're going to extract loss from our history, and then we're going to plot it. Our loss graph looks very healthy, and it looks like our model stops learning at around 150. So 200 epochs was probably not necessary. We're now going to use our model to predict our training set, and we will do the same thing for our test set. Keep in mind that we previously normalized our data. So in order for us to plot it, we need to revert it back to its original state. We're going to make use of our normalizer again, and using the inverse transform function, we're going to revert our data back to normal. And we'll just do the same thing for our test predictions. We're also going to combine our training predictions and our test predictions together using the concatenate function from NumPy. We're doing this so that we can plot them side by side. And now finally, before we can actually plot our results, we need to revert our original data back to its original state, and we will make use of the inverse transform function again to do so. Our data is ready to be plotted now. We will plot x, and then we will plot our predicted values, and we'll run. So it might not look like the perfect sine wave, but the model did a really good job of reducing noise and was able to generalize it to the best of its abilities as a sine wave, including in the area that wasn't exposed to the model. Welcome to the NumPy section. NumPy is most often used in the field of data science and mainly because quantitative data analysis of large data sets is very needed for today's data scientist. Python in itself, as you might be aware from the crash course, allows us to write clean and readable code, and although it being a general purpose language, it lacks the capability of quantitatively analyzing numerical data sets right out of the box. And that is why we make use of a specialized library known as NumPy. The standard package that is now used for data analysis and scientific computing in Python as it also comes with a large collection of high-level mathematical functions. Let's dive right into it and discuss it in more depth. Welcome to lesson number one of the NumPy Crash Course. Let us first discuss why we should use NumPy arrays. Why not choose Python lists? At first glance, arrays appear to be very similar to Python lists, although they are more convenient when dealing with numeric operations. A one-dimensional or multi-dimensional array generally consists of a homogeneous grid of values that are all of the same type, whereas lists would be the Python equivalent of an array, but are heterogeneous in the sense that they generally contain, generally contain elements of different types. This is the most obvious difference. A more subtle difference lies in their functionality. NumPy arrays allow vectorized operation, such as element-wise addition and multiplication which is a lot more concise than how it would be done with Python lists. Its concision ensures clean code when dealing with numerical operations. Let's have a look in Jupyter Notebooks, where we compare vector addition with plain Python code versus vector addition with NumPy. We'll create two lists with the range function. Make a variable list2 is equal to a list that ranges from range 1 to a stop integer of 4. Recall that the stop integer is exclusive, stopping at the integer previous to it. And set another variable, list3, equal to a list that equals the same thing, range from 1 to 4. We'll set one more variable, list sum equal to an empty list for now. There is a reason why I named one list 2 and the other list 3. The goal is to raise every element in the first list to the power of 2, yielding 1, 4, and 9, and every element in the second list to the power of 3, yielding 1, 8, and 27. 
Then we want to add these two lists, resulting in the list sum of 2, 12, and 36. We'll first try this with Python lists, and then we'll do it with NumPy arrays. With our list, what we'll do is we'll declare a for loop for index in range 3. The number 3 corresponding to the length of both lists. We made 3 our stop integer, that way the indices that we'll iterate through will be 0, 1, and 2. If you're not familiar with what we're doing at the moment, make sure to look back at the Python crash course where we discussed for loops. I can then access and modify each element on both lists with the index that's being iterated through. We'll start with list2, list2 index. So every element on list2, according to the index that's being iterated through, we're going to set it equal to itself. List2 index but we're going to set it equal to itself raised to the power of 2. We'll also do list3 at index. We'll set that element equal to itself raised to the power of 3, giving us the required values. Inside the for loop, for each element that we're modifying in list2 and list3, we'll add them up and append it into our list sum. That is, list sum dot append will add both elements that are currently being iterated through and modified. List two at index plus list three at index. And now outside of the for loop, if you print the sum, print list sum, we get two, 12, and 36. Now that was a lot of work. There is a reason why NumPy is known to be a lot more convenient in numerical operations. Because with NumPy arrays, all of this could have been done with three lines of code. No looping necessary. We'll give it a try. To begin using NumPy, we'll have to import it. Import NumPy as an alias NP. This imports all the submodules and functions from NumPy which can be accessed from the alias np. We'll first make use of the numpy arrange function. We'll set array to is equal to numpy np.arrange 1 to 4. Arrange is very similar to the range function that we saw in the Python crash course and are currently seeing right now. They are similar in the sense that they both have a start, a stop, and a step even though so far in this lesson we've only made use of the start and stop integers. The stop integer works the same way as it would for range. It stops at the integer previous to it. So we're going to have a sequence of integers 1, 2, and 3. The main distinction between the two is that range would create a list from 1, 2, and 3, but a range creates an array from 1 to 3. We can print this for clarity. Print array 2. And indeed, that is what we get. It's very important to recognize this as an array, not a list. Notice an array doesn't have any commas. The array is a specialized data structure intended for numerical data. We'll discuss it in more depth in the next lesson. For now, this is an array. And to raise every element of this array to the power of 2, all I have to do is just raise it to the power of 2. Run the cell, and this works out perfectly. It raises every element in the array to the power of 2. If you try doing this with a list, we'll comment this out for now, and raise one of the lists to some power, and Python yells at us we're not allowed to do that. That's one advantage of working with arrays. We will do the same thing for the second array. Array 3 is equal to copy and paste the following and we'll change this to a 3. We're setting all elements of this array to the power of 3. And if we print this, print array 3, accordingly it outputs an array with each element raised to that power. Finally, we just need to add the elements of these two arrays. We'll delete these print statements for now. And we're just going to print array 2 plus array 3. 
run the code, and it outputs the expected result, all within three lines of code. If you tried to add two lists, as we saw in the Python crash course, it would simply concatenate them. Whereas with arrays, it took the summation of each homologous element. Before we end this discussion, we talked about element-wise addition and exponents. But some other operations that we can take advantage of are subtraction, multiplication, and division. However, aside from basic mathematical operations, NumPy also offers us a wealth of universal mathematic functions that we can use to operate on our array. All of these universal functions performing element by element operation over our array or a set of arrays. We'll go over that later on. For now, we'll go over some common mathematical functions accessible to us through NumPy. The first one being NumPy, or np.power. What this does is it will raise all the elements of our array by a corresponding power. np.power, the first argument is the array itself. We're not going to use the arrange function this time to make our array. We'll try another method. On the basis that, in general, numerical data arranged in an array-like structure in Python, such as a list or a tuple, those can be converted to arrays through the use of the array function. Array, taking in a list or a tuple, whichever one you want, a list of one, two, and three. This will convert our list to an array. Now that we have our array, the second argument will be the corresponding power. It will be to the power of four. If we run this, array is not defined. I forgot to add the np alias, which gives us access to all the submodules and functions from NumPy. So don't forget to add your alias np. If we run this again, notice our list enclosed by the array function. Indeed, this is an array because if we print it, outputs the array itself. Now, alternatively, we could have just written np.array and raised it to the power of three as we did previously, this would have worked as well. But it's good to be mindful of universal functions. We'll revert this back. Another commonly used function is numpy.negative. The first argument being our array itself. We'll just copy the array that we have over here. This function speaks for itself as it simply returns an array with negative values. I got a parentheses, and there you go. Let's also print this. And now, notably, we have access to the exponential function, np.exp. And we'll take the exponential of every element in our array. And you know what? Instead of copying and pasting this over and over, what we'll do is we'll create a new cell with alt enter and set a variable sample array is equal to np.array, one, two, and three, and replace it at every instance. And now we'll take the exponential of every element in the array. And indeed it does take the exponential. We can also use the log function, np.log, which takes the natural logarithm of each element in the array. We can output this and it takes the natural log. We can also make use of trigonometric functions. All trigonometric functions use radians when an angle is called for. Recall that the ratio of degrees to radians is 180 over pi. We can take the sine of all elements in the array, np.sine, sample array, and it takes the sine of every single element. This was a very simple example of why NumPy is more convenient than normal Python code when it comes to numerical operations. We first demonstrated that vector addition is clearly a lot easier with NumPy, such that we're also given a wealth of universal functions that we can use to operate on these arrays, element by element, all of which can be accessed in documentation. With NumPy, indeed, there are many mathematical functions that will make our lives easier. A lot of vector and matrix operations are available to us. However, it also goes beyond convenience, as NumPy arrays also have smaller memory consumption and high performance relative to their python list counterpart, ideal when reading or writing from several large terabyte files. Now that we know why we need NumPy, in the next lesson, we'll discuss the multidimensional NumPy array object.
Welcome to lesson number two of the NumPy Crash Course. In the last lesson, we got a sneak peek of what NumPy arrays are capable of. Let us now direct our full focus towards the n-dimensional array. Generally, the n-dimensional array is homogeneous. That is, the items that it's composed of are all of the same type. An n-dimensional array is defined by its shape and the item that it's composed of. The advantage of all items being the same data type is that now you know every item has the same size block of memory. Each block of memory in the array interpreted the same way. This makes it easy to determine the storage size required for the array. Let's start by discussing the shape. The shape of an array represents a tuple of array dimensions. For a one-dimensional array, the shape would be a tuple of only one value n, where n is the number of elements in your array. For a 2D array, the shape would be nm, where n is the number of rows, and m is the number of columns. In the last video, when you created your array with the arrange function, the array from 1 to 3, you actually, not knowingly, created a one-dimensional array whose tuple representation would be written like so, a tuple of one value 3, 3 representing the number of elements in your array. This one-dimensional array, this vector, is often used in mathematical operation. Typically in this course, we'll be dealing with higher dimensional arrays. How do we create a multi-dimensional array? Well, back to Jupyter Notebooks, recall that arrange is equivalent to Python's range function, but returns an array rather than a list. Let's make use of it again to create a 3x3 three three NumPy array by first importing NumPy as np to access all the submodules and functions from numpy through this alias np we'll make a variable x is equal to arrange np.arrange 3 which creates an array of three elements ranging from 0 to 2 note that this is equivalent to writing 0 to 3 but by omitting the 0 it's assumed that you're specifying a start integer of 0 up until your stop integer of 3. Your array will therefore have three elements, ranging from 0 to 2, since the stop integer 3 is exclusive. Set y equal to the same thing, np.arrange3, and do the same thing for z. All of these arrays are one-dimensional, each containing one row and three columns. However, if we were to combine them together, we'd get three rows and three columns, thus a 3x3 three three array. We can do that by declaring multi-array is equal to, we'll create our 2D array with the array function np.array. This function requires an object exposing the array interface. In essence, something that's array-like whose method returns a sequence. A Python list will work just fine. We want our array to then combine all three arrays, x, y, and z. Based on what we passed into our array function, the output of this, what's returned, will be an array object that satisfies the specified requirements. Go ahead and print multi-array, and it outputs three rows of data. Each row has three columns. We can further show this by printing the shape of the array. Print multi array dot shape. And it outputs a tuple indicating a three by three array, three rows and three columns. If I remove the X, we're then missing a row, thereby outputting a two by three array, such that we still have three columns. Alternatively, we could have created our one-dimensional arrays with np.linspace rather than arrange. This is similar to arrange in the sense that np.linspace, first let's write it down, it has a start and a stop index, they both have it. That is, if I specify a start index of 1 and a stop index of 10, it's going to grab numbers from 1 to 10, and the third number indicates the amount of samples that we want to generate between 1 and 10. Let's assume I want to grab 50 samples. If we print w, 
we get a one-dimensional array of numbers between 1 and 10. More specifically, it returns 50 numbers, and all numbers are evenly spaced. If we make this into 100, it gives back 100 numbers, all evenly spaced from 1 to 10. Do not confuse this with arrange a step integer. On a new cell, copy and paste what we have. I will call this B. B is equal to np.arrange. And if I indicate a step of 3 and have the numbers go from 1 to 30, the sequence is still going to be from 1 to 29, except that it would grab every third element in the sequence, whereas with linspace, this third argument specifies how many elements we want from 1 to 30. If we change it to linspace, it would grab three numbers from 1 to 30 that are all evenly spaced. So take home message. With arrange, this indicates step size, whereas with linspace, it refers to the amount of samples between your range. If I put this back to what it was and remove the step size for now, just to make things more intuitive, notice how with arrange, the stop integer 30 is excluded from the sequence. It goes from 1 to 29, not from 1 to 30, whereas with linspace, it does include the integer at which we're stopping. It indeed goes from 1 to 10. It would still go from 1 to 30 if we specified it as such. Well, the thing with that is that linspace has a fourth argument. It's a bool value, which is by default true. If we set it to false, then it's not going to go all the way to 30. It is excluded. This was just to get you familiar with a function that creates 1D arrays aside from a range. But now let's quickly move on to indexing. We'll go ahead and delete this cell, this one as well, and we'll go back to our previous train of thought. In the last video, we indexed a one-dimensional list using a single integer. The notation for indexing a one-dimensional array is the same, and it is also the same thing for a two-dimensional array, such that we can still write multi-array, and inside these brackets, is where we're going to indicate the index that we want to access. Although, since this is a two-dimensional array, indexing is done with two integers, not just one. The first integer, we're going to call it n, indicates which row we want to access. And the second integer, m, indicates which column. We'll start by changing the range of our second array. It will go from 3 to a stop index of 6, so from 3 to 5, and also changing the range of our third array. It will go from a start integer of 6 to a stop integer of 9, so it's going to have a sequence going from 6, 7, 8. Accordingly, if we print out the multi-dimensional array, it seems that I forgot to put back my x, it would indeed output 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 8 each row containing three elements. Suppose I want to access the number zero. For our three by three array, rows are indexed from zero to two. Zero is located in the first row, which would correspond to row zero. Columns in this case are also indexed from zero to two, such that zero is also in the first column, column zero. If we output this, we get back a value of zero. The value 5 is on the second row, third column. It is therefore on row 1, column 2. Output the value, and it results in a value of 5. Clearly, selecting elements from an array is very simple, and if you've done the Python crash course, you'll realize that it's very similar in how we index lists. Except now we have two integers, which represent the indices of the item in the array. If this array was three-dimensional, at the moment it's two-dimensional, as you can see by its shape. If it was three-dimensional, you would require an extra integer. Finally, before we end this discussion, recall that NumPy arrays are generally homogeneous, such that items composing the array are generally, as you can see, all of the same type. We declared a homogeneous array. 
Therefore, the elements of that array can be described by the data type object, dtype. That is, by printing on a new cell, print multi array dot dtype, it outputs int 64, which indicates that all the elements of my array are 64 bit integers. Many functions like array, like arrange, have a data type argument, which allows you to specify the type of your output array. In our case, by default, a type int 64 was inferred, 64 bit integers. We can specify the type of the output array to be something like int 16. That is, d type is equal to numpy.int16. If we run this cell, I forgot my comma, and run the subsequent cell, the element types are now of integer 16. It could even be an unsigned integer of uint8, for example. And now all element types are uint8. The point I want to make is that the Python integer and float type that we saw in the crash course, they are not enough for scientific computing, whereas NumPy has a lot more numerical data types than Python, whose precision depends on memory requirements, such that the numerical types typically end with a number that indicates the number of bits associated with the type. That is all we're gonna cover for the NumPy array object, as well as selecting elements from an array. In the next video, we'll look at how we can slice arrays. Welcome to lesson number three of the NumPy crash course. In this lesson, we'll look at how we can extract a range of elements from an array by slicing. First, we'll look at how we can slice through a one-dimensional array. This is very similar as to how you would slice a Python list. If you've watched the slicing video in the Python crash course, this lesson should be very familiar to you. In fact, the process is almost identical to how you would slice a list. Slicing one-dimensional arrays is done with a set of indices which specify a range, the start, stop, and step size. The start integer specifies the index where we want to start slicing the list. The stop integer specifies the index until which we want to stop slicing. And the step size specifies the spacing in between the sequence of values that we sliced. Let's look at some examples. We'll make an array that ranges from 1 to 9 by setting x is equal to a range. Actually, before doing so, we have to import numpy as np, as we've always done before. And now set x is equal to np.arrange. The start index will be 1 and the stop index 10. Go ahead and print x. And now from x, we want to grab everything from the number 3 to the number 7. The number 3 is positioned at index 2, whereas number 7 is positioned at index 6. So we'll slice the array x from index 2 to index 7. The stop index is exclusive, meaning that it stops at the index previous to it, thereby grabbing everything from index 2 to index 6. Print the result of the slice, and it goes from 3 to 7, index 2 to index 6. We can also indicate a step size of 2, such that we're still grabbing everything within this range, but it only includes every second number in the sequence. This is very similar to how we sliced a list in the Python crash course. Some of the same shortcuts we talked about lists can also be applied to arrays, such that if I omit the starting index, it assumes that you're going to start at the very beginning of the list up until your stop index minus 1. So let's try it out. And indeed, we get the numbers 1 to 7. We're starting from index 0 all the way up until index 7. Or 6, I should say. We'll put 2 back as our start index. So it's going to start at index 0, 1, 2. And from that index, we want everything on the list up until the very end. If you omit the stop index, it automatically assumes that you want everything in the array beyond your start index. 
run the code and it sliced everything from index two to index number eight. Much more concise. That is all for slicing one dimensional arrays. This should have been very familiar to you. In the next two videos, we'll kick it up a notch and slice multi-dimensional arrays. I will see you then. In the last lesson, we looked at how we can slice through one dimensional arrays. Before we can slice through multi-dimensional arrays, we should learn how to reshape them. Creating a 1D array is very simple. We've done it many times before. First, we'll import numpy as np, and then we'll set some variable x is equal to numpy.arrange9. The array will have nine elements that range from zero to eight. And clearly, if we print this, print x, it prints a simple, boring, one-dimensional array. We can actually reshape this into a two-dimensional array. Reshaping does not change the data or alter the data in any way. Our array will still have nine elements from zero to eight, except now we'll reshape it to have three rows and three columns, all of which still contain the same data. You can do this by simply calling dot reshape three and three print the result, and clearly it's a three by three array, three rows and three columns containing our data. If I tried to make this into a three by five array, we'd get an error, which makes sense since a three by five array implies 15 elements. We only have nine. Remember the new shape must define an array with the same total number of elements. Your dimensions must be compatible with the data. If I were to actually put minus one, which denotes an unknown dimension, then the amount of columns in this case is determined such that the overall number of items in the reshaped array must work out to nine, given that we've already specified three rows. If we run this, it's going to work out to three columns like we had it previously. We can actually take this one step further. Instead of just nine elements, we can make this into 18 elements and we'll reshape this array to be two by three by three. Go ahead and print this. Clearly this array has 18 elements, zero to 17. And we reshaped it to have two blocks of data and each one has nine elements shaped into three rows and three columns. In total, this corresponds to 18 elements. The best way to think about this is imagine an Excel spreadsheet with two sheets, and each sheet has three rows and three columns. Alternatively, we can reshape our one dimensional array into a three by three by two array. Print the result, and we get three blocks of data, each one with three rows and two columns. The take home message being is that reshape changes the shape of an array according to a tuple of integers. The new shape of that array, its new dimensions, must be compatible with the array's data. Otherwise, an exception is thrown, as we previously saw. Now we can proceed into the slicing and indexing of multi-dimensional arrays, and we'll do that in the next lesson. In the last lesson, we looked at how we can reshape one-dimensional arrays into multi-dimensional arrays, such that the new dimensions are compatible with the array's data. In this lesson, we'll look at how we can slice these multi-dimensional arrays. We'll start off with this two-dimensional array with three rows and three columns. We've already covered indexing early on, but we'll go over it again very quickly as it segues pretty well into our discussion on slicing. Suppose we wanted to access the number seven. The number seven is on the third row, second column, and to access it, similar to how we accessed one dimensional arrays, we'll use brackets to denote the indices. The third row corresponds to index two and the second column index one print out the result, and indeed we get our value. Imagine we had 18 elements, and we're now dealing with the three by two by three array. And we want to access the number 10. Imagine this was a building with three floors. 
The second floor where the number 10 is located would have an index of 1. Now think of the elements as rooms arranged in columns and rows. Room number 10 is on the second row, which would have an index of 1, and it's also on the second column, which also corresponds to an index of 1. These indices therefore represent the position of element number 10, and indeed this is reflected when we run our code. So that's it for selecting a single cell from our array. What about segments, slices? This again is very similar to how we would slice a one-dimensional array. Suppose we want to slice the numbers 6 to 11. All of these are numbers on the second block of data, which has an index of 1. The numbers 6 to 11 are present in both the first and second row, therefore we would be slicing from the row indexed 0 to a stop index 2 meaning it would go from row 0 to row 1. So we're on the second block of data from row 0 to row 1. Now we just need to specify the range of columns. The numbers 6 to 11 are also present in all three columns. Therefore, we would be slicing from the column indexed 0 to a stop index 3 which corresponds to the columns indexed from 0 to 2. Running this gives us the numbers 6 to 11. Since we're accessing all the rows in this block of data, we can actually omit the range here, and it will be assumed that we're trying to access the numbers in both rows. The same concept applies to the columns as well. Since we're slicing all three columns, we can simply omit the range and it will be inferred that we're trying to access everything from column zero to column three. One more thing to note is that since we're accessing the elements in all the rows and all the columns inside of floor one, we can omit the stop integer, leave only the colons, and it will be assumed as such. And now, since we have multiple colons, we can use ellipses instead. That's another shortcut. This replaces both of our colons and clearly is still equivalent in its functionality as it produces the same output. What if it didn't matter what floor we got our data from, as long as our data is in the first row, first column? Once again, since we want data from every floor, you can either specify the entire range, which would be from zero to a stop index of three, therefore from zero to two, or you can simply omit the indices and it will be assumed as such. And now the first row in whichever block of data is denoted by the index zero and the first column is also denoted by the index zero regardless of which block we're in. Running this code outputs the result zero, six, and 12. It doesn't matter which block of data our rows and columns are in as long as it's the first row and first column that data is displayed. To introduce the concept of step size, we'll revert this back to just displaying rows and columns on the second block of data. And we'll actually slice all the columns and all the rows with two colons instead of the ellipses. And now what we can do is we can also select each second element of our slice by indicating a step size of two and clearly it grabs every second element in each row, 6, 8, 9, and 11. Before we wrap up this lesson, we'll also introduce conditional selection with Booleans, meaning I can select elements from a list based on a comparison operation. First, we'll set a variable, comparison operation is equal to x is bigger than 5. We'll go ahead and print comparison operation. And what this will do is it creates a new array where each one of its elements is an evaluation of whether or not the elements of this array are greater than five. Obviously the elements that go from zero to five are going to return false since they are not bigger than five, whereas the rest of the elements evaluate true. 
we can use this comparison operation to return all of the elements of the array which are greater than 5 by simply placing it in the brackets as we did for slicing. x brackets comparison operation. And the output should return all the elements of the array were this expression evaluated to true, hence returning all elements greater than 5. We can go ahead and place the comparison operation directly inside of our brackets instead of declaring a new variable. It's still going to grab all of the elements in the array that are greater than 5. That is it for conditional selection. You will encounter it quite often in this course. We can also use the built-in max function to grab the highest number in the array. That is, I can write x.max and similarly we can use x.min to grab the lowest number. That is all we're going to cover for indexing and slicing. In the next lesson, we'll look at how we can further manipulate array shapes.